if you don't mind, I'd like us all to have a moment of silence for the humble instruction manual. One of the true unsung heroes of gaming. As games have become increasingly digital in recent years, physical instruction manuals seem to have gone the way of the dodo, which is a crying shame because they were more than just a technical guide on how to operate software. They were our first introduction to a whole new world, its story and cast of characters. Sometimes a game's instruction manual gave the player more information than even the game itself would, as back in the day, they had little time for things like cutscenes or tutorials, so if you jumped right in without reading, you might have had a hard time figuring things out. You'd also miss out on some truly weird pieces of information that the creators saw fit to include. Lucky for you, if you're someone who didn't always read the manuals, we've combed through and gathered up some of the oddest secrets, tidbits and mistakes that made their way into these bygone relics of gaming history. I'm Ashton from Triple Jump, and here are the 10 strangest things hidden in video game manuals. Number 10. Wario World, 2003 that Wario is a bit of an odd chap, isn't he? He's greedy, gluttonous, lazy and excessively flatulent, yet at the same time, he's an experienced treasure hunter and the president of a video game company who is strong enough to power drive anyone who crosses his path through solid concrete. A true study in contradictions, that one. So what is it that makes Wario tick? Fortunately, or perhaps unfortunately, his first outing on the GameCube was prepared to give us an answer. Buried in the very back of the Wario World Manual is a cutaway diagram of Wario's body labelled with all sorts of fun facts about his anatomy. Interesting, but why exactly they saw fit to include this baffles us. For example, did you know that Wario's eyesight is 2070 and he's never had a cavity in his life? Well, now you do. Did you also know that his stomach can hold up to 22 gallons, a capacity that's more than 20 times that of the average adult human stomach? That would explain why he's able to swallow an entire motorcycle whole. Oh, and did you also know that the capacity of Wario's bladder is… actually, on second thought, maybe there are some things better left unknown. Number 9. Rygar, 1986 Translation is a difficult and often thankless job, one that's usually only noticed when it's done poorly, but it's also rather important in the video game industry. Game development is an international business, and without translation, many fantastic games would never leave their country of origin. Sadly, good translators are hard to find. Which brings us to Rygar, a Japanese side-scrolling platformer for the NES that is actually quite good but suffer from a less than perfect English translation. From start to finish, the manual for Rygar is rife with unintentional hilarity in the form of broken formatting and garbled sentences, such as explaining that collecting a coat of arms will qualify Rygar to receive medicine. I, for one, had no idea that the process for attaining healthcare for video game characters was so brutal. But the real crown jewels is found in the section that describes the game's enemies, or as the game calls them, animalised men wriggling in eerily, which may actually be one of the best descriptions of video game foes ever written, and includes such luminaries as Super Robot, Bargain and Epplecon, who attacks by dropping snow grouse eggs. Rygar may not have the most technically polished translation out there, but the fact that we're still talking about it years later means it did something right. I tip my hat to you, animalised men. Number 8. Metroid, 1986 the final scene of Metroid provided what may be one of gaming's first true plot twists when hard-boiled bounty hunter Samus Aran took off her helmet to reveal that she was, well, a she. While it may seem quaint by today's standards, female protagonists were not a common sight in video games at the time, and this simple reveal would become a defining moment for an entire generation of gamers. It was a twist that Nintendo took great pains to conceal. In order to even have a chance of witnessing the reveal, players needed to complete the game as fast as possible, under five hours to be precise. The game's manual wouldn't provide any hints either. Throughout the story recap, Samus is consistently referred to using masculine pronouns pronouns, purposefully giving the player the illusion that the protagonist, whose cybernetic shoes they were stepping into, was a man. In the Japanese manual, Samus is referred to with gender-neutral pronouns, so the use of he and him in the English version was a deliberate choice. That's a lot of layers of obfuscation for one game, but it all paid off by creating a truly iconic moment. Number 7. Sonic Heroes 2003 
Dr. Eggman, or Dr. Robotnik if you want to get serious about this, has done a lot of bad things over the years. He tries to take over the world on a seemingly weekly basis, he's tortured enough small animals to fill a zoo several times over, and there was that one time that he blew up the moon. But one thing that you can't accuse him of, apparently, is sexism. According to his character profile in the Sonic Heroes instruction booklet, the egg-shaped egomaniac professes to being a romanticist, a gentleman, and of all things, Things, a feminist. So he would torment thousands of harmless wooden creatures without a second thought, but he'd never mistreat a woman? Are we to assume that all of the little squirrels and birds that power his machines against their will are men? And does that make it better or worse? There has been much debate amongst the Sonic fan community about the meaning of this phrase, with some arguing that ladies man would make more sense than feminist. Either way, it seems that we should give Dr. Eggman some credit for not being quite as much of a jerk as he could have been. Good work, I guess. Number 6, Pokemon Red slash Blue version, 1996. It's easy to forget that there was a time when Pokemon wasn't the best selling franchise of all time, but when Pokemon Red and Blue first hit the scene in 1996, and most people couldn't tell a Blastoise from a Bath toy, they needed something to show players the ropes. The manual was a good primer for everything a 10 year old child might need to set out on their own Pokemon journey, like how to catch a Pikachu and trade it for their friend's totally awesome Metapod. Most crucially though, it also teaches the player how to battle, even including a chart for the game's ever important type matchups, illustrating which types are super effective or less effective against other types. So far, so good! Except for one tiny detail. The chart included in the manual is wrong. If the chart were to be believed, psychic type Pokemon are weak against ghost type attacks, and this was the original intention of the developers, as is evidenced by some in-game dialogue that backs it up. But due to a programming oversight, psychic Pokemon are actually immune to ghost type moves meaning that anyone who tried to go into battle based only on what they read in the manual wouldn't stand a ghost of a chance. Number 5, Caesar 3, 1998. Simulation games can get complicated. It's hard enough just being in control of a single space marine or a kid with a sword, but being in charge of hundreds of people at the same time can be downright overwhelming. So, for a city building sim like Caesar 3, having a well put together manual is essential to ensure the players understand the ins and outs of the cities they're running. For the most part, Caesar 3's manual does its job, but even in the best manual, things can end up a bit confusing for everyone involved. In a table outlining the functions of the game's many architectural structures, the manual's writer appears to have been a little bit confused about why two types of statues do the exact same thing and thought to themselves, what the hell is this plops? Paraphrasing slightly of course. Except they didn't just think it, they actually wrote it down. And somehow this little editorial note made it all the way into the published version of the manual, where it quickly became a favourite in-joke of the community. It really goes to show just how important it is to proofread your work, or else you might Note to self, insert joke here before sending script to presenter. Okay, who was in charge of editing this one? We are not leaving that take in the video. Number 4, Super Mario Bros, 1985. The Mario games have never really been known for their rich, complex narratives, despite the obvious unanswered questions. I mean, sure, we all know that Bowser kidnapped Princess Peach, but why did he kidnap Princess Peach? And who is Bowser Jr.'s real mother? Are Wario and Waluigi related or not? And why are the animalized men wriggling eerily? Some of these questions are doomed to be mysteries forever, but it turns out Nintendo actually did give us an answer for the first one, in the manual for the original Super Mario Bros. According to the prologue, the evil King Bowser has cast a spell upon the Mushroom Kingdom and has kidnapped the princess because she is the only one who can break the curse. What exactly did this spell do, you ask? Well, it would seem that Bowser's black magic has transformed all the Mushroom Kingdom's inhabitants into the most insidious form imaginable brick blocks. The very same blocks that Mario has smashed thousands of over the years in his hunt for coins and power-ups that are, allegedly, rewards from the Grateful Toads that he has, uh, liberated? All sounds a bit fishy to me, to be honest. Number 3, Rayman 3, Hoodlum Havoc, 2003. 
This next one goes out to everyone who's ever been made fun of for playing a game without reading the manual first. You know the control stick moves your character, you know which button makes you jump and which one makes you punch, and sometimes you can just work out the rest as you play, especially if there's a tutorial. If this sounds like you, then Rayman 3 Hoodlum Havoc is on your side. Murphy, Rayman's coach, who acts as your guide throughout the game's tutorial, tells the player everything that they need to know about the game by reading it straight out of the manual itself, even calling it a useless piece of junk, since it only contains information the player would already know. Oof a bit uncalled for. Eventually, the apparently sentient manual has stood all it can stand and fires back at Murphy with its own barbs, proving that this is one book that definitely has a spine. This rivalry continues even when the game is turned off, as reading through the actual manual's character profiles reveals a quite unflattering biography of Murphy, written by the manual that is so caustic there's a disclaimer from Ubisoft themselves. Ouch. Number 2. Duck Hunt, 1984 when I say the words duck hunt, there's probably a certain face that appears in your mind. A certain grinning, laughing, mocking canine face. For decades, the so-called laughing dog from Duck Hunt has been haunting gamers, showing up only to point out our failures and make fun of us for losing, yet always being just out of reach of retribution. As it turns out, there's somebody else that failed duck hunters can direct their ire towards instead, and that's whoever happens to be sitting next to them on the couch. Written clear the clearest day in the Duck Hunt instruction manual is controls for a two-player game. Player 1 mans the gun-shaped zapper controller and tries to shoot the ducks, while Player 2 uses a standard NES controller to direct the ducks' flight path to try and avoid Player 1's shots. Despite not even being meant as a secret, the existence of a two-player mode in Duck Hunt came as a surprise to many, and went viral after Seth Rogen tweeted about it in 2018, giving players a fresh chance to finally shut that dog up once and for all. Or to fail again, and now have to suffer the ordeal of two people laughing at them. And number one, Earthworm Jim, 1994. The console war between the Sega Genesis and the SNES was a wild time, and the fighting didn't stop even when games were released for both systems, as it was common for one version or another to be seen as a superior product. It was easier to favour development on one console over its competitor, and different specs between the two meant that something would have to be cut or altered in the porting process. Take Earthworm Jim, for example. Most of the game was built for the Genesis first, and since the Genesis controller only has three face buttons, one of the SNES's four face buttons went unused. The game's manual acknowledges this fact by claiming that the X button turns on Mrs. Schultz's porch light in Germany. Just a goofy little gag, right? Wrong! In level 3 of Earthworm Jim 2, the player is forced to participate in a quiz segment where one of the questions they might be asked is, where does Mrs. Schultz live? You would only know the correct answer if you'd read the first game's manual. Having to read the manual before playing a game is one thing, but having to read the manual for a previous game too, now that just feels like homework.